Will the Lord be with you? Yes. Lord, we ask you open our hearts and minds, heal us of our blindness, and use our weakness and our sin to draw us closer into you and to be a more fully human being. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. So what we're going to be talking about today is a thing called the Enneagram, and it's basically a personality profile wheel, and it helps you understand yourself better, so it's a personality self-discovery tool, but it's much more than that. Its purpose is to help in our conversion. It's a tool to help us grow in our faith, much more so than it is something just to know about yourself. It's something that helps you understand in a way that can actually work towards growth in faith. So it, it looks mysterious, but and it, a little bit, but, it, but it's not. I first experienced it through Father Richard Rohr, and I'll be following a lot of his thinking as I, as I present it, uh, back in the uh, early 90s, and found it to be really helpful to understand why I do or don't do certain behaviors and, and the way I see the world and why everybody else seemed to have everything wrong and I, you know, it was also really helpful my wife as she discovered uh, her number and what motivated her, it was, it was eye-opening for her and that's, that's part of it. Um, so it's, Enneagram, any is just uh, from the Greek word for nine, and gram just means diagram, so it's just, it just means nine-pointed diagram, so it's not anything magic. But it's, um, it's history. Now, Father Roar thinks it goes back to the early desert fathers. Hello. Hey. It goes back to the early desert fathers. But when it was rediscovered, really, or what, what they found it was through the Sufi mystics of is the Islamic world, and they had been using it, and it's long time been an oral tradition only. In fact, when Father Roy learned it back in the uh, 70s, he, they, you know, it's, don't ever write it down, it's an oral tradition, pass it on. Well, at a certain point in the 80s, it really began, become more popular and began more, and books were written, so he has taught it to people, like in a, in a seminar, and then of course he records it, like he records everything he does, and has made it, made it available, and it's uh, helpful in that, in that way. So, so that's kind of a short history, but um, to try to understand what it is, of course it is that personality wheel, and it is that, but it's not, um, it, it isn't just, we don't want it to be just a part of the game, uh, and like learn a little bit more about ourselves and oh, isn't that nice? We want it to be a tool to transform who we are, to better grow in our faith, and, and hopefully it'll help us get over, I think like humps or, or blockages in our life. And it's, I, I find it helpful in, in relationships too. So you came in a little bit late. Did you have any particular questions? Um, my mind's open. Okay, okay. And feel free to ask questions because um, this is the first time I've ever attempted to teach it or to explain. I've explained it to individuals and I usually do get a lot of blank stares and it gets confusing. But people's questions seem to um, clarify better than anything else. So I'll begin with a scripture. This is from Romans chapter 7. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, Evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. This is that mysterious passage of Paul as he's going through this diatribe of you know, back and forth between grace and the law and, and Romans, and he comes that, like, I know this law is good, but yet I can't seem to do it. And I think there's a certain sense of, in each of us, that we're, we're a mix of both good and bad, right? We're, we have p 
positive qualities that seem to just flow out of us, but we have negative qualities or we can call it our, our sin. And in some ways the Enneagram likes to call it our chief sin. But we could also think of it as being our compulsion. And the compulsive self that wants to, it's the knee-jerk reaction that we have to things rather than the more uh, informed, liberated idea of, of how we want to be and acting the way we want to be. And so that Enneagram is by nature a negative system. And what I mean by that is we begin by discovering what our chief sin or compulsion is. And as you discover that, it can be fairly humiliating. And in fact, if you don't feel a little bit embarrassed or humiliated that, oh yeah, that's, that is me, you may not be getting it quite yet. Um, and it takes a little bit, but it works through us in that way. And I'm, going to, I'm trying to explain the overall uh, process a little bit. And then after we get an idea, I'm going to go through each of the numbers kind of one at a time because the discovery of who you are on, on, the, on the Enneagram, it's an intuitive system. We're going to take a little questionnaire to kind of help us figure out where we, where we fall on this, but it's a very intuitive system in that um, you, you, you just, when you find out, he's like, that's me. When I listen to it the first time, so I'm a nine, just to make it easy, and he begins with the one and works his way around, and each number, I was like, oh, I can relate to that some. Oh, yeah, that makes a little bit of sense. Yeah, I have a lot of those qualities. But when he got to nine, it was like, oh, that's me. <laughs> and, and it tends to be, even if you're any of the numbers, you're listening, it's like, no, nah, me, or, you know, you just kind of, but then when he talk, you, you, you would think that, oh, how does this person, why are they using me as an example, because it'll feel like that. It'll, the ideas will resonate with you as you begin to. And if you've done any personality things, has anybody done the Myers-Briggs type test? And they, they label you introvert and extrovert, which is fairly obvious in what those mean. But as you do it, it's, you're like, I'm an INFP, which is introvert, intuitive, sensing, feeling. And the reverse of that, like, We'll use the last one. So sensing versus judging. Well, in our culture, especially in the church, if somebody says you're judging, well, that's got a very negative connotation, right? But the way the Myers-Briggs is using the word judging is not judging like the negative of being judgmental. It's that you, when you, when you encounter life and reality, you make decisions quickly. You make judgments, you know, that's how you move. The, whereas a sensing person, which, you know, has like almost a positive quality, oh, they're sensitive, or they're, they have a feeling for things. It's like, no, it just means you can't decide, really. It means you want to hear all the facts first. You want to feel it rather than a judging person, they move up here in their head. They see the facts, they make decisions. Whereas a sensing person, you know, they can think about things. They're not, it's not they're unintelligent. It's just that the decisions are made more in their gut. And then it's like they go with that feeling. Not that it's uninformed. And so there's a really, so those words. And so the same thing with these sins. Now, if we remember Christianity 101, that the early church came up with the seven deadly sins, right? And if you remember, they're what? Wrath or anger, pride, Envy, greed, gluttony, lust, and sloth, or laziness. But this has nine, right? And it's almost like they stop too soon. The number three and the number six. You see their sin is deceit, and the other is fear. I think the early church didn't see fear as a sin because it's so omnipresent in everybody. I mean, everybody deals with fear. But the six on, on the Enneagram takes fear to it, they make an art form out of it. It's part, it's, it's in them, it's their chief sin, is to, to be controlled and move from this fear. Uh, and three, on the other hand, is now deceit. Now that sounds like a sin, but we're not talking about deceit like uh, someone who would lie to cheat and steal to get what they want. It's deceit in, in who they are. So the three, 
they're the people that they're the achiever and they've always got to succeed. They always have to either succeed or look like they're succeeding. And so they're always putting their best foot forward. And so the sin of deceit is they won't present the real them. They won't present the honest them. They're going to present the polished version of themselves, which is deceitful in a personality kind of way. So you see the explanation of these. So like my chief sin is sloth or laziness. But if you know me, uh, my, Kathy she's just like still shakes her head. She's like, you are anything but lazy. What well, doesn't mean lazy like um, someone who just doesn't want to work and is always trying to get out of work. It's, it's a laziness of lack of focus. A, a very unfocused energy. And so I am the quintessential procrastinator. And it's that kind of laziness. And so you begin to questions at this point? Does that kind of make sense? You don't have to understand. I'm trying to get you to get like concept. What's number five? Oh, no, I'm to see. Five is avarice or greed. Greed. Okay. I was like, I'm either going to have to sit up here and Google it or, or ask Wally. I know. Avarice. Probably, probably come up with a word like that because nobody likes to be greedy, so I'll just be avarice instead. And deceit is when you deceive yourself. No, uh, it's that, um, it's that they, they, they present always their perfect view of themselves rather than the honest self. They'll put forward always like the bright shiny. Um, I don't know what our president is, but he, he, he exudes a lot of three energy. Um, he always, he turns every failure into a win. He always puts forward his best foot in a certain way, right? I mean, Mr. Trump will always turn any kind of his failure, he'll turn it into what looks like, at least to him, success. Now, that might be for all kinds of reasons. You don't know why people do stuff. But that's the kind of theory energy that they'll always. My, one of my bosses at my old job was a theory, and they, he always is best foot forward, always is sort of, it was hard to get to know the real him, but over time. So, so it's that kind of deceit. I mean, he would never lie to you. I mean, he always spoke the truth, as far as I could tell, to me. I mean, he was really honest. So it's not that kind of deceit. But for him to fail, to not look successful, he would take anything kind of failure. And next thing you know, man, we're doing good, aren't we? It's like, I'm like, I, I, this, look, this project looks like an utter failure, you know. And he was like, nah. and next thing you know, we're, like, we're looking pretty good. So I'm like, I like working with this guy. <laughs> So that's why deceit and pride are part very close together, right? No, uh, that I wouldn't. I don't. I don't know about that. Yeah, not sure. And even then, the pride, which we generally, it's a different kind. It's 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 more ingrained in our personality and who we are. Did I miss something with the pointing of the arrows? Those are these. This is just the diagram. I'm going to explain the arrows later. I just didn't know if I missed it. This. I was wondering if anybody. They're even pointing the wrong direction. So I clipped a lot of these pictures from the internet, so, okay. So, but one of the keys about it being a negative system is that in exposing our, our work self or uh, our demons, that's how we overcome them. If you try to kill your demons or your sin or your compulsion, it'll just either go underground and come back someplace else stronger. Rather, it's, it's taming. What is uh, my quote here? Is we don't, let's see, until you tame your demons, you'll never know your angels. So until you tame your demons, you'll never know your angels. So the idea is an exposure of them and bringing them out into the light. Um, so I, I picked a scripture to help us connect and see if it works from Colossians. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. This, taking it on like this psychological level, is, is Jesus at the cross overcomes uh, the principalities and powers of the world, and he displays them in a public spectacle. Uh, and what the Romans used to do after they won a battle or a war, and they came home, They've got their prisoners in tow, probably chained like this, walking behind the long line of horses. So they're not only being towed 
you know, through town in, in rags and beaten and humiliated. But everybody can see, you know, the public can see the, the enemy, the big bad enemy, now exposed for who they, just people, just people that lost. And this idea, if we can bring out our, our chief compulsion into the light and see it for what it is, its power is diminished. And so the more light we put on it, the more um, its power in our lives to control us is diminished. Uh, and I think that's part of what happens at the cross. I mean, it's, it's always sort of a mystery. Why is it that we have a public execution at the center of our faith? Well, one of the things that happens at the cross is what we do as humans, that we kill, crucify what's good. Um, and Jesus exposes that. He's like, that's what we do. And we have to accept that. All of us have to kind of accept that on some level, we crucify, we kill what's good. And as that's exposed, it loses its power in our life and we can catch ourselves in the midst of blaming other people for our problems. And we can begin to take ownership for our own. And then it happens in all kinds of different levels. So, of course, like the, you have to remember that the mystery of the cross is, uh, what do they say? It's, it's like, a, uh, like an ocean that the tiniest baby can go and wade in the nice water at the shore, or the, the deepest minds and the highest technology can spend lifetimes fathoming its depths. So there's a lot there. But one of the things that it does is expose humanity's sin. And so the same way the Enneagram, by pulling our sin, our compulsion, out into the light, it helps lose its power. So just briefly, the nine types. So you have like a, an idea Starting at the one, and I'm, I have a handout, and you'll get, I think, this same, this same printout, so it's a little easier you don't have to write it all down. Um, starting at the one, the one is the reformer or the perfectionist, and they're motivated by uh, reforming their world as they see it, by what they encounter. They, they're, the, they're the classic good boy, good girl. They want to do what's right, and they're deeply motivated by that. The two is the helper or caregiver, and they have this desire to, to help. Their identity is wrapped up in their helping. A uh, funny thing about a two, in, at least in America, probably most women have a lot of two qualities because that's what our culture tells you to be. You know, women should be helpers or helping or helpful. But also nature itself. You gave birth to a baby that cannot take care of itself in any way, shape, or form. And you have to give all of its needs. In fact, you have to intuit their needs. You have to know what they need because the baby gets sick. I really need to have my ear cleaned out because it hurts. She's going to say she's going to cry. And you have to figure that out and help her. And so you become trained in this sort of quality of helping. Well, but a two, someone who's by personality, a two, that's who they are. I mean, it's like... Um, it's part of who they are and their identity is wrapped into that completely. Um, the three is the achiever or the performer. They're always about success. They, they're not really good enough unless they're achieving. They're, if they're not winning, if they're not succeeding, they feel that deep sense of failure. And so, it, and so that's, they, they become the achiever. Uh, the, in, the four is the individualist or the tragic romantic. These people are almost always the artistic types. If they don't actually do art, per se, they, um, they just have the aesthetic eye. They know how to make things nice. They know how clothes, how things go together, how to arrange a room so that it's the most. But they're also they're very individualistic. They have this compulsion to be unique. And they, they don't want to be like everybody else. I mean, the worst thing in the world that could happen to a four is to walk into a room and see somebody else in the same outfit that they meticulously picked out. Uh, it just would kill them. You know, they might even run out. <laughs> Five is the thinker or the observer. Uh, the, the classic, I mean, they almost always have glasses, even if they don't need them. So they have some place to hide behind. They, they tend to be, like, on the fringes of the group watching. And they have this deep need for knowledge. And they, they're always filling up their tank with knowledge. And knowledge is its own reward. They're, they are uh, avarice readers. Their sin is, is greed. 
but they're not greedy like, like Scrooge, who keeps all this money to himself. They're more like greedy with their time or their space. They're always looking for that quiet time to be reading and collecting more knowledge. I think my dad was a five, and the funny thing about fives, I think, is that they, um, they don't always do anything with their knowledge. So my brother and I were, were glad as my dad retired a little bit early as the, the place closed down. So he closed it down and retired and he started playing more golf and he got started getting golf digest and was reading it. And my little brother would play with him sometimes. He said, I don't know why he reads those. I don't think he uses any of those tips. I mean, it was just a few days later he actually even said it. It was like, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. But, you know, I never really put them into practice. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, ah. Oh. So that's kind of a... And, and the funny thing about these numbers is they're easier to spot, like, the, the, the compulsion or at them at their worst, each of these types. At their worst, it's those compulsions that are easier to spot. The, the good qualities, you know, you, you don't spot them as much. You spot them more through their compulsion. But that's part of the, the way it works. And just to be clear, no number is better than the other. They like to use the numbers because, you know, numbers are value neutral. Um, that, that, you know, a one or a two, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make any judgments. So these are all, you know, just one is as good as the next. It's just how we're made and part of who we are. Six is the loyalist or the questioner. Now, uh, their, their chief sin is fear. And so in that, that fear, they don't even know that they're fearful per se. You don't think of them necessarily as fearful people. But that's that motivating that they can't or they don't want to make any decisions or on their own. And so they very often belong to a group and they're loyal to a T. So like the company man that never questions the company. This is what the company does. Uh, you know, the, the Pope would be a classic, you know, six energy in that you know they really belong to the group and the, they support the group at all cost and, and uh, the church makes the decisions for me so I don't have to um, and that's that's what but the six is a funny number because in response to their deep-seated fear they can either be loyal to the group or they can be the anarchist they can do the exact opposite and say you know they'll like they belong to the anti-group so they if you want to do go left, I'm definitely going right. They take this completely opposite side. And so it, uh, and uh, Richard Rohr in his last talk was saying that it's possible some experts think that maybe half the world are, are sixes. But it should make sense, and it's hard to spot in the sense because everybody deals with fear. I mean, the world can be a scary place. So, but they just take it to an art form. Uh, so seven is the enthusiast or the epicurean. Do you know that one, Lita? He was a philosopher, but it's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Right? They're the party people. Seven, sevens are the party animal type. That's their, they, they're always looking for a new adventure, and if they're not having an adventure right now, they're making a list of all their adventures they're getting ready to take, and they're getting ready to turn this into an adventure. And um, They can be really scattered because they have such a long list of things they want to get done and accomplish, um, but they can also... They're also going to be a lot of fun. I mean, they're, they're the ones that when they go to Walmart and it's an adventure. Me, you know, it's just it's just a tedious job. I can't wait to get over. But you know, they they make it, somehow they make it fun. And and their, their chief their chief sin, of course, is gluttony because then they tend to overdo. And so they don't necessarily. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're like big fat eat too much. It means more they're just for that always one more thing is going to make it better. If if one is good. 12 is way better. That's what Jack the Gleason said. Anything worth doing is worth doing in excess. <laughs> there you go. That's a very good seven statement. Eight is the leader or the challenger. They, um, they're super confident with themselves. When a feeling hits them, they say it. You know, if they don't like something, you'll know it. You will not be surprised. You know, they don't hold their feelings back. They went right there. And they know what's right. And they are not afraid to tell you what to do. Kathy's good friend, Missy, that was here for a couple of months, um, just wanted, she, at one point she told Kathy, I just want you to do things the way we do them. 
And it was like her daughter was like, <laughs> mother. <laughs> That's just how she sees it, you know, that, 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 that. And they can be very strong personalities, like larger than life, and uh, they can be really bossy types, but they can also, the funny thing is, their, so their, their sin is, is lust. So it's that just, um, that kind of overpowering control. So not necessarily like lust like uh, at the adult bookstore all the time type lust. Just that the, the, the lust for life. And so like, it's a little bit like the seven, like more is better, but taking it to extremes. But they can be also really great defenders of, 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 of injustice. You know, when they see something going wrong, they step in. Um, they, they take action. And they're, they're the people that can speak up quickly when they see something's wrong. Of course, it's always as they see it. Just like all of us. But, but there, it's like so, as they see it. And you're like, uh, finally, the nine up at the top, the peacemaker, the mediator, um, always trying to get along, always trying to make everybody happy. I don't want to, you know, I avoid conflict like it was the plague. Um, and and um, we're easy going. We're trying not, not to offend anybody. That that sort of personality, you should see that. But um, we can also be so much so that we you know blend in. That we won't hold our our own ground. And so if I'm talking to somebody uh, on this side of the argument, I'll do my best to get along with them. And then I'll go over here and I'll talk. And then it's like, so you're pretty wishy-washy. And then I get in the middle, I'm just really angry at myself for not having my own ground. So questions kind of at this point? Okay, about this number nine, would that be like President Harding, the last person in? Was the man who made up his mind? I mean, he seated yeah. advice. All right, so he calls all these people in one at a time. And the last one to speak, that's the one. He didn't know, you know. What. That would be very, yeah, that would be a very nine kind of energy to do. And when you look at the different ones, you can kind of guess at people as you kind of get more familiar, but you, you don't really want to do that because it's, it's about you because nobody can really know your motives. Um, the best example I, I think of is, okay, it's like a one who's the perfectionist and the five who's the thinker observer. Both of them, as you watch their behavior, could, could be a, a very um, avid readers, reading all the time. And you would see that and you think they were a lot alike. Oh, they must be similar. But when you kind of dig through it, the one is always reading because they're trying to improve themselves or the world or the situation or whatever they're doing. They're always trying to make things better. So they're reading because information is, gives you power to be able to control things, right? To be able to fix things. But the five who's reading all the time is because knowledge is a great thing. You can't have too much knowledge. Boy, you better get more facts. You know, if, again, like if one fact is good, you know, if you need like some facts, let's get more facts. And a, a book is, there's never enough books about anything. But so from the outside, but then as you dig deeper, their motivation for why they do these things is different, right? Um, just uh, like, these are like positive things that each number might say to themselves. So the one would say, you know, I'm right and I can fix it. Um, I, the two would say, I'm helpful. I know what you need before you even know. Three says I'm successful and I can make things happen. And, and they can. They're super efficient. They get ten times more done than, you know, others in a day. Four says I'm unique and I appreciate a stick. I, I can make things beautiful. I know if I tell you that this is the way something should be, that's the way it should be. They have good sense of aesthetics. Uh, five is is, uh, you know, I'm perceptive, I seek knowledge, is like, and that's a good thing. They would always want to say, like, yeah, I'm, I'm very perceptive, you know, I, I'm always looking for more information. Six would, would say that I'm the glue, I'm loyal to the group, you know, I'm, and they are, and they're great to have in your group, they, they, they're with you thick, thick and thin, and they do help hold the group together. Seven, I'm fun, I see the bright side of everything, because if you don't, that would be painful, and they're trying to avoid pain. The eight, I'm powerful, I'm responsible. They might say I'm in charge. And the nine, I'm easy going, easy to get along with. 
But on the other hand, like under stress, and you want to see like the compulsive nature come out, the one it, it tends to be overly orderly, overly self-controlled, overly critical, judgmental. The two can feel deeply unappreciated. They can get really bossy and guilting. They can also be very manipulative because they want they so want you to need them. They're going to find a way to make you need them. The three, uh, they can be overworked. They can get super competitive. They can start undercutting. Like in other words, uh, do whatever they need to do to win. Uh, and their competitive nature comes out, and it's like where, by opposition, like the nine would say, like you know, it's just a game. A three would never say it's just a game. They would say, winning is in everything. It's the only thing. And so you get that kind of negative. The four uh, can become really self-conscious, moody, hypersensitive, hyper, hypersensitive. The five, they, they disengage and they're stingy in the sense that it's like pulling teeth to get anything out of them. So if you're talking with them and you want to know what's going on, they're like, I'm fine. Yes, you know, like, and so like they're, they're, they're like a psychologist's worst nightmare, like to have a five in their, in, their, in their seat across from them. They can't get any information out of them. They're, they're, they're classic preoccupied um, people when they're, when they're you know, like, are you listening to me? And, no, they're not. You know, they're, they're in another world with their thoughts living up here in their head. The six can become very anxious, um, very eager to please, and they can vacillate between what to do, because they can't, if they're feeling stress and they're not feeling supported, they can't make a decision until somebody with authority helps them make that decision. They, they want to look to that authority. So they tend to be, um, like this is, this is the kind of energy where, where fundamentalism comes out of them. Right, wrong, always, and this is, and they take it to extremes. They take it to such extremes that um, it can be dangerous. So it's that sort of energy. Or, or not. That's the other side of the six when it can show a different side. I'm not going to let anybody tell me what to do. I know what's right. But they don't do it so much out of right. They do it out of opposition to the authority. As opposed to the eight knows. It's them, them who makes the decision. They're very independent that way. Or the four. It's like, it's not about the group. It's about me. Well, the six, it's about the group. And so they're Opposition to the group is, is just that. Uh, the seven, they can get <laughs> pumped. Overactive and excessive. They, they're just too much, too much. They'll have so many things to do. And they get stressed and then they complain about it. But they are just over, over, over. Yep. Aren't seven and three almost the same? Yeah, you, right, exactly. Right, they can get... They can, but the thing here is a good example, then, right? So the theory here becoming overworked and doing too much because they have got to be successful. They have got to look successful. They don't actually have to be successful. They just have to look successful, and that's what's motivating. The seven is actually trying to avoid a sense of um, emptiness, and they're trying to avoid pain. And so if I stop moving... I will have to think about my life and feel like the pain in my life, and I'm not doing that. I'm going to keep moving. A moving target's hard to hit, and so their motivation is really different, what's going on inside them. But, but from the outside, you're like, oh, those, those look similar. It's so easy to nail these to specific people that we know. <laughs> 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 yeah, and, and then you, you can kind of you can kind of do that, and you see some of those energies, and so. But there's fear. It's always fear that seven is always fear. Seven, seven's coming. We're going to get to like this kind of yeah. deep because there, you see, there's nine, and I said it's like it's the seven deadly sins plus two, but it's also it's also three gr groups of three. So like, you know, the human body, human spirit is sort of divided up into three for simplest head, heart, and gut, or body. And so you have three groups of that, but then each of those groups is thus divided up into three parts. And so then that's how they, something like that. 
the eight controlling, aggressive, impulsive. That that they're really easy to spot when they're acting that way. I mean, it's hard. And the nine, that self-effacing, uh, disengaged, stubborn, passive-aggressive is the other one that's great. You say, oh, they're so great, easy to get along with. I'm like, yeah, just wait till I get passive-aggressive on you, you know, and you like it drives you nuts. So we're going to take we're going to take a few minutes and do a questionnaire. I'm going to pass out and kind of go through it now. It's 36 questions, and there's, each question has two statements. And you're going to agree with one more than the other. And some of them you're going to go, uh, I don't know. Pick the best one. And you want to do it uh, as quickly as possible. Just check, keep checking off and go through them quickly. And um, that will help get, because you want sort of that natural, not overly thought out response. And if it's helpful, think about yourself as a young adult, you know, in 25, 30, becoming a real adult on your own, and how did you behave, how did you, what did you do then? And try to avoid that, well, sometimes I'm that way, but sometimes I'm not. What are you most of the time? Yeah, you know, most of the time, yeah, most of the time that's what I do. And some of them are just, they're just like, they just won't make sense. And others you'll go, duh, isn't everybody? I mean, so you'll be easier to check. And the way the questionnaire looks, so you have those two statements for each one, and then there's nine columns to the right. And in each, uh, yeah, nine columns, but in each row, one of them has a box in it. So if you agree with that statement, you X out that box. And then we're going to add those up, and then each, each column will then have a, a value to it, and then out of that, we can, it'll help point us in the direction that you are. And I'll, and I'll walk around and help you and that kind of stuff, okay? Right, and actually, so the Enneagram is really unhelpful to people in the first half of life. Do we want now, a pencil then? Oh. Is it a pencil we want? It doesn't matter. <coughs> See, what a nine thing to say, it doesn't matter. You said unhelpful? No, it's not. What's unhelpful? Oh, yeah, and when I say first half of life, it's not. You're talking over 22. Uh, well, I'm not talking about a numeric value to your age. It's not 45. Right. Some people in their 20s move into the second half of life. And some people somewhere in their 70s or 80s maybe move into the second half of life. This, this place of where you move from being really in your basic compulsive personality and who you've developed as a young person to a more mature um, separate it somewhere from your knee-jerk reaction of your personality. Uh, fight any temptation to think that, well, maybe I'm a combination of two, because you're not. You, you're, you're one number. But the Enneagram tries to take into account that humanity, our personality, are way too complicated to just be reduced down to a number. And so somebody asked about the arrows and the going this way. It has all kinds of variants to it, but you're basically one number, and you can be at very so. Keep that in mind. And just work. If you have questions, so one is two questions. I've been romantic and imaginative, or I've been pragmatic and down to earth. One of those you've been most more often than not. You're one or the other. Doesn't mean you've never been romantic if you're pragmatic, etc. But what do you? basically, and then check that X. And again, some of these questions won't, and they'll, the test will weed out some of the errant, because we're all, you know, we're, we're much more complicated than just that. So you do have other traits and talents, but. One of, some of these are pretty close to each other. Sometimes Pick one. This and then this one. Pick the one you mostly, and think about yourself as a younger, younger man, mm -hmm. like what would I have done then, and then. Sometimes it helps too if you, you do if you skip it and come back to it. Just don't skip well, it. it completely. And then looking for like parts of it that resonate with you. Yeah. You're more always like ah. You mean in while you're reading. Yeah, reading like what what it means. Because <clears throat> you you can read it like a horoscope. You can pick up any horoscope and you read it. It's like wow, <laughs> isn't that so true today? And then the next day it is. But if you read a bunch of them after a while, so you can find yourself in in any of these, and especially as we're. 
as we're older, we've grown in our faith and, and matured some and gone through uh, uh, things in life, you naturally, you know, mature and begin to become more balanced and not, you know, it's when you're a little bit younger that you still... Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I did this with Nancy Haynes yesterday. Everybody that came to the office poor things were victims of my research. Because I... <laughs> Because uh, when I, I took it, came up with my number, I was like, okay, well, it seems to work. And then Kathy took it, and I, I, it, she didn't match my guess. And I was like, okay, well, maybe there's... So I had a couple other people do it. So that way I was a little bit more prepared. But when I did Nancy's, you know, she came up stronger one number. Um, but as she read the description, she was like, oh, this is, this is more who I am. And we talked a little bit, and it was like... So even though it wasn't her highest number... She definitely, because the numbers, they, they don't really mean anything unless, it, what matters is that, yeah, that's who you are. I mean, the test is just to help you, you're a four. I'm a solid four. You're a solid four. Does that sound like you, as you describe it? Okay. So last night what we did, we had more people, and we divided up into tables by our number. Yeah. And I had that's people, fun. I had people talk to one another, but I think we have so many, so just, what's your number? I still can't decide between four and seven. You're seven. <laughs> You're a nine. Uh, I must be a four. Seven. I, I agree with this one. You're a four, the individualist. Yeah, that's probably you. Yeah, three. You're the achiever, yeah. yeah. You can get stuff done, can't you? Yeah. yeah. So you're a solid four, huh? I'm a middle child. Four and two. A four and a two. You, that, that as you read this description, does this resonate? much more with you, like this creative... Much more. Yeah, so that's, so you're a four. So then the four, let's see, four, you share a space with the two. You see that line goes there? And I'm going to explain that better uh, yes, later. <laughs> so, so then like you four, so we have two fours. You and Don are both fours. Huh? I, I don't see Martha and Don as a lot alike, necessarily. He's smarter than I am. Um, your life experience, you know, it dictates a lot of who you are. You know, a, a male four and a female four, you know, they will present things differently. And so, Both have but there's, we're talking about like a kind of a, an energy, uh, a style of attention, a, a, a compulsion, something that motivates you like kind of deep within that makes you do what you do. And, and that as opposed to outward characteristics. So I like did last night was to kind of, so we have only only two fours. Everybody else is a different number. How many fours did you Because you're a seven. No, we have, a, we have two sevens. We have two fours, two sevens, a three, a, oh, we have two nines, a five. Here we go. So, so, so the five and the, she's a three. So, so you two are, are the same number. You two are the same number. You two are the same number. You're a five, and you are a three. You're probably a five. Okay, so, so what I did last night. So then they broke into groups and kind of asked these questions. Well, I, I just made these questions up myself, trying to get you to talk about, you know, what goes through your head and what motivates you. But, and then we ran out of time, and we're basically running out of time here. So I'm, and, and we're going to have the next two weeks off. Next week is spring break, mm -hmm. and then the next week is Holy Week, and they don't pay me enough to work that hard. <laughs> so we're taking those two weeks off, the and then we'll start again next week. So when we start again in three weeks, in April, right? yeah, it'll be April, it'll be after Easter, we're going to begin with a review. <laughs> so these handouts you can take, you can look it up, and it has like some, there's tons of information on the website. I'm going to put together a little thing and email it out to everybody so they can... Um, Maybe if they, if they want, I can touch base on it. Um, um, so just know, real quick, you see I have this divided up. You see it has the, the gut, the eight, nine, and one are the gut people. Two, three, and four are the heart people. And the five, six, and seven are the, are the head people. So they're sort of in those, those groups. And you see how like the eight is an X, nine, and so the middle number is what we call the double compulsion. You're trapped in the middle. Um, you have a, a, an, a, a, a gut person on your right and a gut person on your left. And so you, you're trapped in that middle. And you see the bottom, it says, it's hard to read, I know, the blues. The externalized. So the eight, 
So the, the core like energy is that of anger. The eight, nine, and one, the core energy is this, this anger that they deal with all the time. Now the eight, they externalize it. If they're angry, you know it. They tell you, they, 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 like, they own it. They, they're angry and they don't mind telling you and they don't mind being angry. Uh, and on a certain level, they have that energy and it motivates them. You know, um, sometimes it helps to think of famous Martin Luther King Jr. was probably an eight. And what we think of like a redeemed eight, someone who was using their good qualities for good, they have, he has a sense of justice, he knew he needed to do something and he was able to act. Right? Whereas like... Where was LBJ on that? I don't know him well enough, so... So then the nine is this conflicted person I, I don't, I, you know, me, I'm not angry. I'm not angry. I mean, like, I, I don't want to present that sense of anger. I don't, I'm not even sure I'm really angry, but having gone through this, I'm like, you know what, I, I am angry. No wonder I love that kind of music. <laughs> uh, you know, the louder and the more angry it is, the more I like it, you know. It, it, but I'm conflicted between that sense of showing my anger and then the one, so that, just to kind of help make this clearer, is that third position here, and it's the internalized. So the, for the one, you know, to be angry is, you know, good boys and good girls, people that are uh, perfectionists, that, uh, to be angry is a flaw. And so I'm the perfectionist if I'm the one, and so I, I can't be angry. So they deny it, and it's hidden. But whenever we hide something, what does it do, right? It comes up someplace else, right? And so when they... You can see it in them. You can see that, that sort of anger and that kind of conflict. And each one of these like does the same thing. So the three, you know, these are, these are heart people. Not, and not, and they're this, um, but the three in the middle is this conflicted one. You don't always see them as like a, 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 a gushy heart person. Whereas like the two, I mean, they're always helping people. They're always concerned. Relationships, everything's about relationships. They, they almost over-identify with that sort of energy. And then the four is that one that, you know, internalizes it or, and so they, they sort of hide from that and put that that way. So that kind of gives you that idea. And to make it, to make it a little bit more, you have like sort of like nine, I have a eight wing and a one wing. So you borrow from the number to your left and to your right as you look at the wheel. You, you borrow that energy. And so that's why, uh, let's see, do we have a... Uh, like, so like me, I'm a nine, but I have a, I have a strong eight wing. I have a lot of against energy, you know, a, a lot of, you know, want, I want to embrace my anger much more. Scott's also a nine, but he's got a much stronger one wing. He wants to be the good boy. He wants to do what's right. He likes the little, you know, we're moving towards perfection. And, and when he sees things that are, because it, it influences him. So you look at us and we're very different, but then we watch, it's like, oh, Certain motivations, you know, working with them, I can kind of see that. And so you borrow those. Um, so if I was a seven, I go between eight and six? You don't really go between them, but you borrow that energy. Now sometimes, some people, like, they, depends on their mood or what's going on with them, they, they lean a little bit and pick up those energies, or they tend to have... And sometimes if you number, if, you, if you're a seven, if you, have a, if you score it high on six, that might indicate that you have like a stronger six wing. Like Bob probably has a strong four wing that the individualist uh, wanting to be, you know, he's got his own opinion, he's got his own direction, he wants to be unique in that way. So he has that strong kind of four wing. But it doesn't mean it, that defines him, but, but his core energy still comes from that of a five. I'm trying to show real quick these... Uh, this one is wrong. Here it is. So, so the arrow thing. It moved again. Yeah. Oh, I put it back. Yeah. So the, it looks confusing. Right? All these arrows going every which way. So I'm going to try to simplify it. And of course, you're going to learn more about a nine than your own number because that's me, and it's just easier to explain. But you see how? So the red one from nine to three. That's when I'm doing well, or I'm integrating. You know, my my better qualities and using my gifts. I, I move in the direction of a three. And I can see that with myself. So my sin of sloth or laziness or unfocused energy, I'm kind of like, I can't decide. 
But when I'm doing well, I'll take on the gifts of a three where I'm really effective. And I can, I can make clear decisions, I can get things done, and I'll go from like not deciding to deciding and next thing you know I'm flying into action, driving Kathy crazy. It's like, slow down. <laughs> But when I'm not doing well, that is, I'm under stress, and I just, I go towards the worst energies of a six. And I, I'm just, not just can't decide, I, I'm fearful to decide. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to look towards somebody else to tell me what to do until I'm really immobilized. And so all the numbers do that. So on your handout, borrow Don's here, I think I have this right. Oh, I didn't have it. So close, but no cigar. Try to point which arrows, but you can see where you connect it. So you have seven. So when you do you the go in the direction of the arrow, so when you do well, you can move towards the good energies of a five. And so as you read, so, okay, let me read more about the five. Meaning you can go from this unfocused, um, everything's just fun, to a very serious, focused person, and can and can um, uh, get some get a specific thing done, as opposed to twenty things halfway. Okay. Um, but when you see the arrow going the opposite direction towards the one, so when you're not doing well, you're under stress, you can you can move towards those negative energies of a of a one, being judgmental, being angry, being um, self-righteous, you know, indignant even. And so they, all the numbers kind of do that. So uh, this, we'll, we'll begin with a review. You can take this home. I'm going to try to send out an email sometime next week that has uh, just a little bit more information that you can focus on with your number. And the, the main thing, I, I don't know if it's the main thing. Let's see. is we're moving like nobody's either good or bad per se but we we're on a continuum like nobody ever gets to where they only move on their best self and hopefully nobody gets stuck forever in their worst self <laughs> hopefully and but we tend to move and under stress we move towards our compulsions and then under you know good conditions and when we're doing well we move towards our better selves and it's this sort of and so next time we'll Look at this a little closer, we'll review, look at it a little closer, try to understand, well, what do you do with this? And then I'll go through each number with a little bit more detail so that we can kind of like, oh yeah, get to know that, that, that part of you and understand it. It's kind of like that color wheel, you know, in gold. Yeah. You know the color wheel? Yeah. It's kind of like that in a way, you know. Oh, like bleeding yeah. into like you've got the primary colors yeah. and then they bleed into the secondary colors and then into the next one as they combine yeah it, a little bit yeah a little bit but you can't pick you can't pick and choose now you can't pick and you can't just pick and choose but it's like that's that core who you are but you can pick up qualities and traits of all i mean as we integrate who we are better we become more free from our compulsive self and we can pick up. You can become, okay, like I'm, you can be a shy person, but you can learn to, to be out front and do the work that you want to do if you feel called to do that, you know. So, so you can like learn to do. So you, this isn't deterministic, like I'm stuck. I'm a seven and I'm, I've got to be the life of the party. No, that, that doesn't, doesn't work that way. But it helps you understand Ah, this is what motivates me, or this is what I'm afraid of, or I'm trying to avoid. And so it's like, ah, that's why I can't like get this done. I'm avoiding conflict. That's why I can't talk to this person. I'm afraid it's going to be a big conflict, and so I'm avoiding it. I mean, every, nobody likes conflict, but I take it to a whole new level because it's like it's like the capital sin conflict. I mean, that, that's God. That's the worst. And it does help when you know somebody like, oh yeah, that's real typical behavior of that. So, the Lord be with you. Well, it strengthens us in our understanding of ourselves because then we can understand you better and open our eyes to see, not just with our eyes, but with all of our eyes so we can see like you do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.